Amen. We appreciate that. All right, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5, would you agree what they normally say, that a picture is worth a thousand words? I want to prove that wrong to you this morning. Romans chapter number 5, we'll begin in verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. That's why they say never pray for patience, right? <laughs> and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Father, we thank You for the time we can open the Bible together. God, we pray that You might speak to us through this text and through other texts, Lord, that we can turn our attention to the Word of God. Lord, we thank you that we have this book to go on, and God, we pray that you might move us aside and minister the Word of God to each and every heart. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. In His name we pray, amen. amen. I ask you, uh, do you think that a picture is worth a thousand words? And of course, a lot of people think so, because really... People are picture-oriented. Your eyesight is one of those things to where you immediately would rather watch something most of the time than listen to something. Would you rather listen to someone read a 500-page book or watch a $500 million movie production? I'm just saying. <laughs> but they say a picture is worth a thousand words. When you try to teach kids, a lot of times they'll take and they'll have pictures. And they'll go through and they will use the pictures to try to illustrate the, uh, the lesson. I remember uh, we used to use a lot of flannel graph with kids and teaching kids with flannel graph and things. And you put the little man on the thing. And, of course, they all think that uh, Jesus is a white man or, or a European. Or they, they, they get these ideas from you know, from the little pictures we paint, but uh, people learn by pictures and oftentimes people are drawn into things by the visual as well as, well as the audible. But God did not give us a picture book. God gave us words. I think that is very, very important, especially in this picture-driven, image-driven society today for us to understand that words create Sentences and sentences create paragraphs, and paragraphs create stories and thoughts and imaginations. And God tells you in words what heaven's like, so you can imagine it with pictures in your head. God doesn't give you the picture first, He gives you the word. I want to draw your attention to two words here in the text, and we're going to look at a couple other places where these two words appear. I think it's very fitting. As we read through this text, when it talks about, obviously, the fact that we have peace with God through Christ and everything, and that all comes by way of Jesus Christ and having faith in Christ. But then the Bible here begins to go back in verse number 6. And it begins to paint a picture with words about prior to us being saved. And he says, when we were yet without strength. That's the first thing. I mean, picture yourself... Weak. Picture yourself unable 
to do anything for yourself. Picture yourself without strength and powerless. He says we were without strength in due time. Christ died for the ungodly. Picture someone that is ungodly, that's weak, that's away from God. Then he draws another comparison, almost like night and day. Verse 7, he talks about a righteous man and a good person. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. I guarantee you, and I've read of stories, and you know of stories, where people in war especially have died for their comrades in arms. They've jumped on the grenades, they've pushed the guy out of the way. We know of many mothers that have risked and have died for their children. Surely good people have died for other people. For adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Verse 8, here's the two words we're going to look at today. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so I want to look at these two words and see how God paints a picture with two words. And for us to understand, these two words changed everything. I mean, these two words in your life changed everything. But God. Without God in your life, where would you be this morning? He said, well, I'm in the 11 o'clock service and I might would have been in the 930 service. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, where would you be spiritually? Because look at the text. You are without strength. You as good as you are, and I know I'm looking at nice, upstanding Christian people out there, and you're all dressed you're in church, and you're nice, and look, we are all sinners. There's something wrong with all of us. We have that pride, we have that lust, we have that envy, we have that covetousness, we have that laziness, we have that whatever it is, we could go through all the list. We're sinners. Without strength, no way we could save ourselves. The best we could do, the Bible says, is vanity. The best a person can do to try to get to heaven will send him in hell. Will put him flat in hell. The best you can do as far as religion, you can be baptized. You can take the sacraments. You can go through a discipleship class. You can memorize the whole book of John. You'd still go to hell if you didn't trust Christ. You could not save yourself. You are a train wreck waiting to happen. Without God in your life, without God stepping in, without God intervening in your life and saving your soul, you will be on your way to hell. You were weak, but God was strong. You were bad, but God's good enough to save you. You deserve death, but God gave you life. You deserved hell, but God gives you heaven. Notice in the text here, much more, verse 9. Man, it's good that we're saved, but then you begin to study. As so I hope some of you are following our, our salvation series and some of the things we're teaching. But you know, there's a whole lot to salvation that we oftentimes don't comprehend. The Lord has done a lot for us. He's forgiven us. He's adopted us into His family. He has uh, written our names down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I mean, He has uh, made all these provisions for us. And we don't even realize a lot of that when we get saved. You know, when you trusted Christ, He cut away this sinful flesh that corrupts us from the part of you that got saved. The Bible calls that the circumcision of Christ. A cutting away. The Word of God is quick and powerful. That Word comes in there and karate chops on you. <laughs> that Word comes in there and does surgery on you and it cuts away the part of you that got saved and the part of you that was washed clean and now when you do something wrong or you do something bad it doesn't affect your soul the part that does wrong cannot taint and corrupt the part of you that's been right the part of you that's saved and so God's done all these things for us we don't understand these things but then he says much more verse number 9 be now justified by His blood we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And then verse number 10, we're reconciled. So we're justified, we're reconciled, we're saved. All these things have happened. 
And when God justifies you, that's a judicial thing. That's just declaring that you are completely innocent. Not that you have been forgiven, and thank God for pardon. But pardon and forgiveness is different than justification. Justification is God saying, this person here is righteous. Because Christ's righteousness has been put on your account. He doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees Christ's perfect life. So it's a judicial declaration that you're completely sinless. Now, practically speaking, you're not sinless, but positionally, you're in Him. And if you're in Jesus Christ, you're in eternity, really. I mean, He is the eternal God. You're in absolute sinlessness. What a blessing to have all of that. Two little words, but God. I wish we had time this morning to go around and do testimonies. And we could talk about how God came and did things in our life. And how God intervened and God worked some things in our lives. And, and how that we were going along our own way. We thought we had it all figured out. And then, but God stepped in. And so that's the blessing of these two little words. I don't have a picture to show you this morning. I don't have a video clip. I know that's vogue now for the preachers to stand up and have some kind of... You don't need to look at a screen unless you have eye trouble. I know we've got some people with that. But... You don't need a screen. You've got a book to work, look at. You don't need some movie. I'm not going to play you some movie instead of having a sermon. You need to hear words from a preacher and words from a Bible to understand that God did something in your life and you can paint your own picture. You can look back and remember when you were convinced of something that was wrong. You can look back and realize you used to have certain types of feelings. You used to have certain types of beliefs. But God did something in your life. But God changed your position. But God changed your opinions. This Bible got inside of you and started stirring something up in there and it changed the direction you were going on. And that's what God did to me. God took a preacher and He took this Bible and He began to upset my world. And He began to change things. And I didn't mind at first just going along and listening and going in for a little bit of church on Sunday. But then that Sunday message started lasting a little bit longer. It didn't wear off too quick. And I'd be thinking about that thing on Monday and thinking about that thing on Tuesday and thinking about that thing on Wednesday. And then I man, I need to start reading my Bible. It ain't enough just to get a Sunday morning message. I need to start reading my Bible a little bit. And I started reading the Bible and the more I read, the more conflict I began to have. Because the Lord starts saying, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? Oh, uh, that's not right. And see, here's where the thing runs in. People, they, they say all this stuff. They want God. They want to know God. They want to have a relationship with God. But then there are things in their life the Lord says, what are you doing? And they don't want to let go of that. And if you don't let go of that, you can't go any further. And the Lord said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he began to chip away. And that word began to, to, to move like a fire inside of me and do something to me. It wasn't pictures. It was the Bible. It was the word. I've said it a hundred billion times. Maybe this time it'll sink in for you. I'm telling you, some of you are having some problems in your life because you're not in this book. You need to be in this book. And I'm not telling you you've got to read 1,500 chapters a day. I'm just telling you, you need to be in this because this will help you. Amen. And you look back over your salvation experience. We could go on and we could talk about it. How God did things in your life. Where would you be? Some of you, your families would be all busted up. Some of you wouldn't even have family. Some of you wouldn't have what you have. You look back in a little, little domino effect of all these things. And I stand here, I tell you right here, I am where I am as a person because of God. I owe everything to Him. Everything. But God. Sometimes I think about some of the great revivals we've had in history. I think about those men. You ever think about John Wesley? Now don't, you know, throw John Wesley under the bus because of the Methodists. <laughs> now John Wesley had his problems, doctrinally, but God used the man. You cannot deny the power of some of those awakenings. John Wesley and George Whitfield. There's all kinds of Georges. You got King George, you got George Washington, but George Whitfield was very influential with the uh, colonists and the, the uh, revolution. 
anyway because of the, the freedom and the thought that salvation brings. But when you begin to think about these men, I think about John Wesley. He was in religion. He was a uh, Church of England and he was going to try to do a good thing, which is to bring religion to, the, to America. And he's not even converted. And here he is riding on this ship and you have these Moravian missionaries and it's because of those no-names that this guy eventually got saved. That's not even thinking sometimes. Man, look at the domino effect. And you think about all the people that got saved through those awakenings and you go back to where here's somebody these Moravian missionaries being faithful, doing what they can do. I'll bring it up into modern times for us a little bit. Mordecai Ham, one of the preachers, some of you probably don't even realize who he was. He was the preacher where Billy Graham got saved at the revival meeting. And you began to think about these things. D.L. Moody, there was some young man, I think his name was Kimball, he led D.L. Moody to the Lord. D.L. Moody was responsible of millions of people getting saved back in the day. And you think about these things that have influenced us because that's way behind us in church history. You say, what is it? It's God. It's God. Two little words, but God. Take a right turn and come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. First Corinthians chapter number 10. Never get to the place where you write God out of the equation. And sometimes I think we even as believers do that. We get so reliant on the physical. We get so reliant on the visible. So reliant on the pictures. What we see. That we just write God out of it. But look, I'm not you know, getting outside of the Bible here. There are certain things that the Lord is doing in our, di our dispensation, in our age, that the Lord is not due in other ages. For instance, if somebody dies, I don't go up and try to raise them from the dead. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go up and try to raise, heal them and raise them up from the dead. I'm not living back during the first century with the apostles, okay? We understand that. However, you can get so landlocked and so in your mind where all you see is all you know where you just write God out. And you just kind of get used to things and you just kind of cruise and you put it on cruise and you're going through life and you forget that you are even where you are because of God. You have your sense of mind because of God. You have your peace of mind. You have your stability spiritually because of God. But then we don't want to rely on God. We write Him out of the equation. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, Paul here goes back and he's dealing with some of the history of Israel to try to rebuke the Corinthians about some of the things they were doing. And then he brings it up in verse number 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. In other words, don't be so high and mighty. You're talking about these Jews and how they messed up. They worship false gods. Better watch yourself. Verse 13. There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. We often fail, but God is faithful. You'll notice pride instead of humility, verse number 12. You'll notice prevention instead of a cure, verse number 13. It's one thing to get the cure, and thank God you can get a cure for certain things, but the best thing is preventative maintenance. If you can prevent trouble, that's the best way. The best thing to do is learn from somebody else's mistake, not just a wise man or someone who learns from his mistake. No, that's, that's maybe a smart guy, but a, a wise person is somebody who learned from somebody else's mistake. <laughs> you go fall in the ditch, I realize I ain't driving that way. <laughs> I don't have to go fall in the ditch with you. So here we have preventative maintenance. And he says, there is no temptation taking you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful. So when you begin to think about this, this is where that saying comes, God will not put more on you than you can bear. You hear that all the time. And people say that to, just like we quote verses to ourselves sometimes, that's a good thing to do because you have to remind yourself. I'm really getting, uh, uh, this fasting that we're doing of songs is really tough. It's affecting me. I, I need the hymns. I appreciate her singing a hymn this morning. That was good. 
She sung a hymn and not a her. Amen. <laughs> but no, I appreciate that at him because we need to be reminded of those things. And sometimes quoting a verse back, it reminds you. And so these little phrases that we have, sometimes people say, well, I'm having a hard time, but I know I can, the Lord won't put no more on me than I can bear. People say that because they're bouncing that back to get comfort and to get some strength from. But God is faithful. When you go through a trial and you go through a tribulation or you go through a temptation. There are two types of temptation. One temptation is a temptation to do wrong and to sin. Another temptation is just a temptation that's a trial or a test. Abraham was tempted when he was tried. In other words, he had a trial of his faith. That's different than being tempted to sin. God will never tempt you to sin. The devil will. Your flesh will. This world will. But God won't. But God is faithful in any temptation that you go through. What did Jesus tell the disciples to pray? He says, pray that you might be delivered from temptation. And so what do we do? We paint this picture in our head. But God. But God. You face this trial. You face this thing. You think, man, this thing's going to knock the wind out of me. You ever been sucker punched? <clears throat> Amen? We were at martial arts and we always did these exercises where you stand there and you would take hits in all kinds of places. <laughs> and you, you stand there and you tighten up and you prepare to take the hit. And that's one thing. And you, you get where you can withstand a pretty good bit. And then you take kicks and stuff like that. But boy, you're, you're fighting or whatever and, and you're inhaling or something while they're punching you in the gut. It will take the air out of you. It will flatten you. I always got aggravated. Every time I got knocked out or something, or I remember as a kid falling out of a tree. I used to fall out of trees all the time. I was always around older kids. And they're climbing up here like Spider-Man, you know, and I'm a little bitty thing, and I'm trying to climb up there so I can be a big boy. And I'm up there, and I can't even get around the limb they're all swinging on, you know. So there I go. I'm falling out again. Flop. And the most aggravating thing, of course, your breath gets knocked out of you. You think you're never going to get your breath back. They're talking to you and you're trying to talk. They're asking you questions and you can't answer them. It's like, are you, are you hurt? <laughs> I can't speak. The breath's been knocked out of me. <laughs> and sometimes you go through life and you turn around and blam. You did not see that. I did not see this thing the past six, eight weeks coming. <laughs> you, know, you hear a little trickle down, some stuff going on. Oh, they're closing China off or whatever. I don't pay attention to the news. I mean, I'm just not a newsy person. And something's going on. People call me. Hey, don't you know a tornado's heading your way? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Better get in the closet. I, I just not much in tune with all that. And that's bad. I know I need to be a little more in tune to know a little bit that's going on. But... This kind of stuff catches everybody. Preachers have been praying for all kind of years for the bars to close on Sunday, and they finally did. <laughs> but you know, you turn around, and it's like, where did this come from? You go through something in your life or in your family's life or something personally, and then blam, where did this come from? You get sucker punched in your mind, paint the picture, but God. But God. It did not take him by surprise. God is faithful. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. But God is faithful. Now there's a fact of temptation. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tested. There's fears in temptation. But our faith in temptation relies on the fact that God is faithful even when we're not faithful. He says in the text here, every man's been tempted, uh, no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Here's one thing to understand. Other people are going through something similar you've gone through. Other believers have gone through similar things, and God has helped them get through it. And if God can get them through it, why have you written God out of your life? If God can help them in their situation, God can help you in your situation. Granted, everybody's not the same, and God doesn't treat all of His children the same. I think He treats me better than He treats you. <laughs> That's like the old song we sing, God 
treats me like his only child. You know, I'm spoiled rotten, and that's just how God treats me. But I've got my relationship with God, and you've got your relationship with God. The thing you need to realize when you look at this thing across the board is the devil will try to isolate you. And he'll try to get you to think just about yourself. You ever get stuck on yourself? You ever have to look in the mirror more than once a day? <laughs> Do you ever get tired of yourself like I get tired of myself? But you know, we get so isolated sometimes. We think it's all about us and we get so drawn in. And that's a dangerous place. And the devil will use that against you. And get that thing focused to where it's not necessarily pride where you're walking around trying to get everybody to look at you, but it is self-centeredness. And one thing that can destroy you emotionally and spiritually is self-centeredness. You need to be praying for other people. You need to be thinking about helping other people. You need to have your mind on the Lord and your mind on how you be a blessing to others, not just about how you can get better and how you can feel better and how you can just be happy all the time. Everybody's always happy all the time. No, everybody ain't always happy all the time. Every day is not a Friday, no matter what the televangelist, TV preachers that had probably had to sell one of his jets, you know. Oh no, he had to get rid of one of his jets. <laughs> I'm just making that up. I don't know that for true. But the thing is, the Lord lets you see Him working in other people's life. Not to try to compare yourself among themselves because I know everything's about you. But to help you see if He's helping someone else, He will help you. You're not alone in this thing. You're not the only young person. You're not the only older person. You're not the only middle-aged person. You're not the only parent. You're not the only single parent, divorced parent, married couple that's having trouble in your marriage. You're not the only whatever the situation. God says, I'm faithful. You might not be faithful. People around you might not be faithful. But God is faithful. You need to be reminded of that. We think of John Newton oftentimes. For Amazing Grace, the song, but he wrote another hymn. This is part of it. It says, His love in time past forbids me to think He'll leave me at last. In trouble to sink, each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms His good pleasure to help me right through. He's talking about that Ebenezer stone that Samuel had back when God helped them during the battle. And he set up that stone as a memorial and he says, we're never going to forget God. Sometimes you need those Ebenezer stones in your life. Maybe make a little note in your Bible and make a note in your prayer journal when God did something special for you. And you can go back when the, when the, the, the clouds are dark everything's dims, dismal and everything's depressed around you and you're discouraged and you're defeated, just go back to the Ebenezer stone and say, but God. Amen. Well, the world says this, but God. Well, all my friends are saying this, but God. Well, you know, I'm even thinking this, but God is faithful. Amen. You have to be reminded. Think about what He did when He saved you. Think about the pit He pulled you out of. Think about where you would be if it were not for the grace of God. The grace of God will never lead you so far that He cannot sustain you. Where God guides, what's the saying? He always provides. God will provide. And God is faithful. You know, we, like I said, we get that saying. We get that saying that... Uh, God will never put more on you than you can bear. There was a family and they were moving. They had a family of three or four. And they had one little one. He was about five or six. And he wanted to help. And of course, they needed all the help they could get. You ever had to move before. They got all the boxes and all the stuff. So what the father did is he would be passing everything off the truck as they were loading things up, moving in. And he'd have the little boy there and he'd always hand him a small box. Or he'd hand him a box that was light enough that he could carry it. So here he is working, and he's working according, proportionally to what he can carry. And the idea is, God won't place any more on you than you can bear. You say, well, why do I have this in my life? Well, by God's grace, you can bear it, or it wouldn't be there. I've told you the story about my grandmother. She was sick all of her life. She always had problems, and, 
and just was always very sickly. I remember in the summertime, sometimes they would come out to visit my grandfather and her. I mean, in the summertime, she would be freezing cold. She'd sit out in the truck just in the heat. She just cold. She was just sickly her whole life and had all kind of problems and things. And she asked my mother one time, why do you think God allows this in my life? And I guess the Lord just gave my mother a quick answer. And she says, I guess he knew you would be able to take it. The Lord knows what you can handle. And always remember, God is a God of love and God is good. And His righteous judgments endure forever. God is not out to hurt you. And He's not just trying to break you. And He's not just trying to beat you up. And sometimes we have these, these, these ideas of God because they're twisted. Oftentimes maybe through a bad relationship we had. Sometimes if, if you had a bad father growing up, you have a wrong perception of God. God is not a bad father. He is a good father. Amen. And you have to understand that He loves you and He's not going to lay no more on you than you can handle. But preacher, you don't understand, but God. You haven't seen the bills. You haven't seen the stress. You haven't seen the whatever it is, but God is faithful. Even when we talk about temptation to sin, people fight sin and fight temptation all of us do and you buy into the devil's lie that you can't live without it you buy into the devil's lie that just a little bit won't hurt you buy into the devil's lie that everybody's doing it you buy into the devil's lie that it's okay you buy into the devil's lie that you can't get to victory the Bible says God is faithful and here's the thing it's not about you getting victory it's about his victory it's about you claiming the victory that He's already won. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What's the answer? The next verse, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Finally, take your Bible and turn over to Genesis. I want to look at one more. Genesis chapter number 50, and I hope you know the story. Genesis chapter number 50. Here in Genesis chapter number 50, we have the story of Joseph. And you know how Joseph was the beloved son of his father. In other words, he loved all his other sons, but Jacob had a favorite, and it was Joseph. He made him a coat of many colors. He entrusted him with certain rights and responsibilities. He sent his brother Joseph to check on his brothers and different things like that. Well, Joseph had the ability to interpret dreams, and God had given Joseph some dreams as a young boy. And he, you know, either, either one, he was being a smart aleck, or... Number two, he was just overjoyed at what God had shown him, so he told his brothers his dreams. He thought they would rejoice, but they didn't because his dream had him on top and them on the bottom. His dream had him as the sheaf standing up and them bowing down to him. And even him and his dad, even they're like, look, are you telling us we're going to bow down to you one day? He's like, I don't know, I'm just telling you my dreams. And so his brothers despised and hated him, and you know the story. The Bible says that his father sent Joseph out to check on his brothers there. And when they saw him afar off, they said, let's take him and let's kill him. Now, they don't kill him. Reuben, the oldest, delivers him out of their hand. But what he does is he takes, but Reuben goes away. Judah comes up with a plan to save Joseph's life. And he takes Joseph out and he sells him to the Ishmaelites. And he sells him to the Ishmaelites and he goes down and he becomes a slave down in Egypt. And all of this stuff begins to happen to Joseph. And you're thinking to Joseph, you're thinking, where is your dreams? Where are your dreams now? I mean, here you are. You were supposed to be on top. You were supposed to be taking care of things. And now you've got all this happening to you. And where's God at now? He's sold into slavery down in Egypt. And so, Genesis chapter 50, we come to the end of the story, and for sake of time, I think you know the story. You can, you can go right over here if you need to. For the sake of time, if you remember the story, 
you know that he got sold into slavery and everything goes bad when he winds up in Potiphar's house. Things seem to be turning around for him. But then it just goes from bad to worse because she accuses Joseph and he gets thrown into the dungeon. And there he is in this situation to where now it seems like everything has been kicked up from under him again for the second time. Well, these other guys give their dreams. He interprets them. Everything seems to be looking up. He tells the butler, when you get out, get me out of here. Go and get an attorney. Find out that I was innocent. All this stuff was right. They were, I was right. They were wrong. Two years go by, he forgets about it. It seems like it's all over and done now. Again. But then Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh calls Joseph up. And Joseph is able to interpret the dream to Pharaoh. Joseph becomes number two ruler in the entire kingdom. And Joseph is able to save people from dying and starving to death because of his ability to interpret dreams. And also his brothers finally come looking for food. And when his brothers come looking for food, they bow down just like that very first dream had interpreted. Of course, he goes through the whole thing with them. But at the end of the story... After everything's all said and done and Jacob winds up dying, which is their father, the brothers get a little nervous thinking, man, now that our father's dead, Joseph is going to, he's going to come after us. Notice Genesis chapter number 50. Verse number 18, His brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph had no idea. Let's see, almost 15 years prior to this, 13 years, whatever it was. When his brothers took him, beat him up, threw him down in that pit. He had no idea all this was going to turn out that way. But it did. When others mean to hurt you, God means to help you. When everything seems to be at its worst, it might be that it has to be at its worst before it can ever get to its best. But God. He tells him back in Genesis chapter 45, he says, It was not you that sent me hither, but God. So Joseph says, you're not the ones who sold me. You're not the ones who accused me. Potiphar's wife, it's not her fault. It's not your fault. It's not Judah's fault for selling me. It's not the Ishmael's fault. It's not the Egyptian's fault. He says, God was behind this whole thing. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have to see our lives as ordered from God. We belong to Him. He's not going to let something happen to you that He's aware of. Nothing ever catches God off guard. God never says, huh? God never says, oops. We have to back up and see the situation and realize we might not understand it now and it might be difficult now, but if we're living by faith now, we can trust and we can rest and have confidence that it's going to be okay in the end. The worst thing can be the best thing. What others do is no match for what God can do. God's plan is bigger than ours. And we often don't understand His time. And you know, for Joseph, what always seemed like the end was just the beginning of the next thing. I mean, he gets... He loses his coat of many colors. That seems like the end. He gets betrayed by his brothers. That seems like the end. He gets thrown onto the pit. That seems like the end. He gets sold to the Ishmaelite. Everything is just another step into what God's doing. When you get down low, you need to think of those two picture words. <laughs> but God. But God. You ever see one of those corn mazes? Several years back, we've taken the youth to those corn mazes where you walk through there. And I've, well, I've been up to them in North Carolina and stuff, real tall ones. And you're going through there and they give you these things and you're supposed to figure out these codes in order to go and all. 
you, you can't see when you're down in the corn maze going back and forth trying to find out how to get out. You can't see the design. But they'll have oftentimes, you get to the end of the thing, they'll have a picture that they took from a plane. Or nowadays probably from a drone. But that, 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 they'll have an actual design. One of them we went into, it looked like a big tractor. The whole thing was mapped out. From the sky, it looked like a, a tractor had been carved. I guess they have the GPS and they're able to do that. But the point is, when you're down in it, going through it, you run into this block, you run into that block, you run into that block, you can't seem to figure the thing out, and you don't even understand that the whole thing is a picture. And that's how our life is a lot of times. So what is going on in my life? I don't have a clue. <laughs> but God has got it all in control. Let's have a word of prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed, just briefly.